what would be interesting to, to, to hear a bit about is, given that the um, international community, broadly speaking, uh, as Max said, uh, the preference, uh, certainly on the part of most people, is to find a uh, non-military solution to this crisis. Um, I think it is worth trying to understand uh, within Iran uh, what it is uh, that the sense of the importance of this issue is, uh, what is the degree of support for uh, a nuclear uh, capability, whether it's a civilian or military, and, and Roxanne uh, Framan Framayan, maybe you could help us understand a little bit uh, what this looks like from Tehran, this question, and not just uh, the question I put to Max, uh, if you're sitting there and you're the regime, uh, why wouldn't you want a nuclear deterrent given the neighborhood that you're in, but maybe a sense uh, of the political environment as well, and maybe some of the popular views of this, because we hear often that the nuclear question is one that crosses political lines within Iran. Uh, that the uh, people on the other side of the green uh, divide, so to speak, also were supportive, certainly of a civilian nuclear program, but perhaps even more so. Uh, give us a sense of what you think the reality is there. Thank you, Nader. There are several uh, points to be made. There are three baseline perspectives from Iran's view. One is very basically it is committed uh, as a sovereign right to uh, be able to enrich uranium uh, at least a 3.5%, if not higher, under its membership in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, which it takes pride in having signed, and it feels it follows uh, the uh, regulations that have been set out. This is a broadly popular view. The uh, leaders of the Green Movement were as strongly supportive of this as the regime. The many uh, breaks that we see at different times uh, that create factions inside the regime do not appear to be broken by uh, differences of view on supporting the nuclear uh, development partially because it reveals a sense of scientific capability and pride. And that brings me to the second baseline point, and that is Iran is constantly trying to gain a certain legitimacy to be part of the conversation, if you will, in the various actions in specifically its, its uh, region, but also to be recognized as a power by outside uh, uh, strategic players. And so it feels very much as though it wants to be, for example, part of the conversation about Syria. Yes, it's a big supporter of Syria, but up until now, uh, Anan and the other uh, uh, members of the international decision-making bodies that have been playing parts have not included it in negotiations. So it's very anxious, once again, to be recognized as a player. Third of all, it feels uh, very much as though the forces ranged against it are uh, extremely interested in regime change under any guise. And it feels, for example, that the inspections that have come in from the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Association, which it watched send inspectors over to Iraq and there were several uh, uh, covert operations through those inspections that put uh, um, in place efforts to overthrow Saddam. It watched that with interest, and from its perspective, many of the inspections that have continuously taken place during the process of negotiations over these last several years have been followed by assassinations of Iranian scientists, for example. Uh, that, in fact, there are um, roles that are played by the international community and the various international bodies that are often double roles. And it has had little real reason from its perspective to trust a lot of the international communities. One of the elements that has quite recently come to light and which it feels very fearful about is, of course, constantly Israel's capability and nuclear um, holding. But quite recently, it became clear that Germany is building a submarine-capable um, cruise missile uh, 
which will carry nuclear capability and be able to reach uh, Iran at 1,500 kilometer range. Now, it feels very much as it goes into the negotiations that it is being expected to act quite stupidly and stand there and accept that the range of Israel's capability is broadening out while it is being forced not to take on any nuclear enrichment whatsoever. So from its perspective, it's not being told uh, that it can play a fair game. Now, going on to the four strategic perspectives, one of those is that these most recent round of, uh, of negotiations was actually quite a breakthrough. Catherine Ashton, the leader of the EU uh, negotiating team, did not require for the first time in many years that Iran stop enrichment in order to start negotiations. In other words, the negotiations began while Iran was allowed to continue enriching. And this was a breakthrough for Iran. Likewise, she suggested that uh, the negotiations take a step-by-step -step approach so that there could be mutual um, confirmation that various steps had been achieved. This was something that the Russians had regarded as a, an offer that they had made at one point, and the Iranians were very heartened that the P5 plus 1 this is one of those areas where all you do is use these acronyms. So the P5 being the, uh, the veto powers of the Security Council plus Germany, um, that they were actually not offering very much to Iran in exchange for requiring Iran to, to, uh, to halt its enrichment. This was an, uh, a breakthrough in terms of how the negotiations would actually turn into a process. And this was very heartening, which is one of the reasons why in Istanbul quite a lot of progress was made and the next round in Baghdad was looked forward to with some enthusiasm. However, from the Iranian point of view, it was a huge setback when the Obama administration decided that the 3.5 level of enrichment was in fact not going to be acceptable. And that brought the entire uh, negotiations in some real sense to a halt. There's not much that the Iranians can look forward to and what they really want in, in uh, uh, exchange in terms of sanctions is they're actually not too worried about the oil sanctions. They've already started figuring out a way to start shipping oil on their tankers by pulling the transponders, making deals with the various Asian customers, and their oil is flowing. The problem is the financial situation. They are very hamstrung by being cut off of the banking system and the uh, communications between financial institutions, and this is what they would like to have lifted. You know, this is one of those subjects I could go on to six more points, but okay. I think I'll leave it there. Thank you.